Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and this morning I bought some more XRP and XLM. We had a market pullback, and so these are the times that I buy. Um, I'm, I bought some XRP and XLM, and this week I'm going to, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to add more gold and and uh, to my uh, portfolio. I'm also making sure that I have plenty of cash. These uncertain times, the inflation and all the craziness. But the gold is what I'm focusing on a lot right now through Glint, which is one of my sponsors. I want you to see this video so you can really understand what these guys are doing. It is a game changer. Watch this. It's called the Glint's Five Golden Truths. Here are what we're calling our five golden truths. Number one, with Glint, our clients can buy, save, and spend real physical gold digitally even at the checkout, giving instant access to gold liquidity. Two, Glint's clients own their gold. Unlike many of our competitors, our clients' gold is specifically allocated to them, secure in a Brinks vault in Switzerland and insured by Lloyds of London. Three, all Glint's transactions are super safe and super fast. When a client spends their gold using their Glint MasterCard, their physical gold is sold and their transaction is satisfied in the local currency of the vendor within a maximum of one quarter of a second. Four, in the US, your Glint account allows you to save and spend in both gold and US dollars. We have now introduced Glintit, our in-app P2P functionality that enables our clients to instantly send and receive US dollars between Glint accounts, perfect for gifting, splitting bills, or making payments. Also, when U.S. citizens spend gold in any state in the U.S., there is zero charge on the transactions. And five, Glint's FX is up to six times cheaper than the banks. So when traveling abroad, Glint account holders need only take one card with them. No more exchanging U.S. dollars for local currencies at the Bureau de Change. It's easy and inexpensive at 0.5% to spend in gold. And if our clients want to withdraw local currency, they can use MasterCard accepting ATM machines all over the world, again, with minimal fees. The, I'm, more, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about this, this company. In fact, I was talking to my father, who is the official father of the Digital Asset Investor channel. And when he heard me talking about this, he immediately said, I'm opening a Glenn account. And he's, he's uh, adding to gold because he's never seen anything like it. Um, and because there hasn't been anything like it, um, but what the perfect hedge for all of us. Now, the official cool guy of the Digital Asset Investor channel has weighed in this morning. We haven't seen a video from him in a while, but here we go. Let's go, fam. Now is not the time to back down. Oh, by the way, I forgot. There will be a link to, the, to Glenn at the top of the description of this video if that's something you want to check out. Fear is in the mind. I'd say our worst day was the day the lawsuit was brought. Can only get better from here. Remember why you invested. Remember what you hold. All right. Okay. Now, uh, there was also this that popped up on Twitter this morning. Breaking Twitter's in talks to finalize a deal with Elon Musk to sell him 100% of the company after originally rejecting his offer. This could get interesting now this uh i don't know if it was this morning it may have been the other day but blockchain association texted this out the new york state legislator is preparing to ban proof of work mining we're calling on a on all pro tech pro innovation pro crypto nys residents to make their voices heard tweet and email your assembly member via the link below and I retweeted their tweet and I said, hey, Blockchain Association, Kristen Smith, who runs it, the SEC is suing Ripple and John Deaton is suing the SEC on behalf of, X of 66,000 plus XRP holders. Where are your tweets to rally the troops on those? 
After all, you are a crypto industry trade group, right? Question mark. Because the question is, are they? Because that's what they say they are. Or are they just a Bitcoin Ethereum industry group? I think it's becoming pretty obvious. Now, this weekend, I, I found I put out some interesting videos. This is the first one. And let me do a refresh here just to show you how significant this is. This video that I put together, which was showing Andries and Hor Remember, Andries and Horowitz was involved. They were the ones that started the whole thing. They, it's in terms of the meetings that became the Ethereum. They were meeting in secret with the SEC. Those meetings came became the Ethereum free pass. Well, I put a video together this morning that and and the other the other major venture capital it was two major venture capital firms that were involved in those discussions Andrews and Horowitz and Union Square Ventures this video i put together tie, shows you how those two venture capital firms were also invested in multi coin capital and their two partners were bragging around the same time about how they were shorting XRP true story okay well this is one of their founders, Kyle, so, what was his name? Kyle Samani. This is one of them. And, and these guys really have a, I mean, it's like a total beef with it. If you go and search Kyle Samani's Twitter thread, it is one long, I mean, type in how many times this guy mentioned XRP in his Twitter th thread. I looked and I mean, he's got, he just hates rip on XRP. And the question is, if, Rip, if XRP is so irrelevant and Ripple's so irrelevant, why are these guys so fixated on it to the point where he's putting a, sh a shirt on? Why do they care about Ripple so much? The answer to that question is because they know that everything they've been saying is bull crap and that XRP is by far the greatest threat to Ethereum because XRP does everything that Ethereum can't do. That's the reason all these people have been had had such a beef with Ripple and what XRP represents. That's what all this has been about. Watch this. I can prove it. See this guy, Kyle Samani? Check this out. I'm going to skip one ahead and I'll go back to that. At some point, Kyle Samani realized that Ethereum was not what it had been built up to be. And he became a Solana guy from what I can tell reading his tweets. I found this tweet from him. And remember, this guy, same people, have been accused, pointing at Ripple for years. Back in 2018, this is part of the reason they were shorting Ripple. They were pointing at Ripple and they're saying, oh, well, this, is just a, this isn't a blockchain. These are, this is just a centralized company and da-da-da. They own most of it. That was their whole point. I showed you the Two Shard Jane video the other day. A, a, a great majority of the point they were trying to make is that, oh, Rip, see, look, Ripple owns most of this. And they freaking knew. They knew that Ethereum, the difference was Ripple was showing you. They were transparent about it. Intentionally, Joseph Lubin and the Ethereum founders were not transparent. And the, But these guys knew. Look at this tweet. They knew that Ethereum had the same problem, probably worse. The only difference was Ethereum was covering it while Ripple was being transparent and it allowed guys like these guys to point at Ripple and say, see, you're, you're different. You're decent. You're centralized. You're not, you're not as good as, as Ethereum. You're not a serious XRP is not serious. That's what they did. And I believe I'm not saying these guys, but I, I believe that industry wide, it was a concerted effort to do this to, to, okay. It was paint the target. Look at Ripple. We, they're showing what they've got. You can point at them. You can say, look, that's, that's centralized. They own a lot of it. Meanwhile, over here, Ethereum doesn't show anything. And so nobody can point at Ethereum and say, oh, who, who says I own all that? Joseph Lubin said it when he was on stage with Brad Garlinghouse. You know, people say I own a lot, but they don't know. That was by design. Look at this tweet. This is the same guy, Kyle Samani. The, con the concentrated ownership argument is bullshit. Bitcoin and Ethereum are insanely concentrated. Saying these are okay and soul is not is just ridiculous. The biggest holders of Ethereum, Lubin and others, aren't transparent about it. Sounds kind of like what we've been saying for the last year, folks, doesn't it? 
So here's, here's what I said. Think of it. These people have attacked Ripple for years, pointing a finger about the centralized ownership. They were, they were able to because Ripple was transparent. Meanwhile, the Ethereum founders showed nothing, but they all knew it was centralized ownership and pretended that they didn't. They pretended that they didn't, folks. Now, I want you to watch this because I, I put it all together for you. This starts with Lowell Ness of Perkins Coie, this video. It's nine minutes. I'm looking at my time clock here. I'm going to just let this video be a little longer. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play the first half of this. Okay, we're going to play four minutes. And then in my next video today, I'm going to play the second four minutes just so that this video is not too long. So it starts with Lowell Ness. In the beginning of this video, they're describing to you what happened, how the Ethereum free pass came about. And in the second part, I'm going to show you that the same people involved in all of that were on the other side. They were shorting XRP while they talked it down. It, what, it wasn't enough to just get the Ethereum free pass. He, he, he then, after talking to Grunfest in a fireside chat at the Stanford um, uh, campus, uh, made his way over to see Andreessen the next morning. And this is the part that now not a lot of people know. Um, and he invited um, Chris Dixon to round up the sort of the, the industry um, players who were really kind of trying to do it the right way um, and asked for a couple of things. One, essentially, you know, lay out in a very detailed written for, for, you know, footnoted memo um, what existing law says about utility tokens. Um, and two, give us a proposal for where to go from here. Um, and so, uh, uh, Andreessen, I've been representing Andreessen and all of their crypto um, investments since the... Since so I want you to th make sure you understand what you're hearing. So he's describing Andreessen Horowitz and then Chris Dixon of Andreessen and Horowitz, and then he puts together the group, which includes Union Square Ventures. And so, um, so I got the chance to be the one to, to write all that stuff. So, uh, and I pulled in uh, Cooley, and I pulled in a couple of law firms. So we've, we've now got a nice little working group of uh, law firms that are in the space that are doing this. If uh, we get the SEC's blessing. So the last six or seven months, We've been very much engaged with the SEC on a number of fronts, one of them being uh, Andreessen Horowitz reached out to the chairman when he made a speech at Stanford saying, we're going after the lawyers, we're going after the account. All right, I want you to think about what she just said. So Jay Clayton m made a speech and Joseph Grunfest was on stage. Now at the time, Katie Hahn was, was on the board of Coinbase I believe she was all, I mean, I can't prove this, but I believe she was already involved with Andrews and Horowitz. I think it's the same thing. I believe that they intentionally put a pretty face in the front row. I think they put Katie Hahn in the front row so that she could have, because she asked Jay Clayton a question in the thing. If I'm, if I'm betting dimes to donuts like Mike Novogratz does, I think that they, they put Katie Hahn there so that she could talk Jay Clayton right there into walking over to Andrews and Horowitz the next day. That's how I think this went down if I piece it all together in my mind, because this is how the world works. This, th that's something I've said for the first time here. I'm just telling you that when, I, when this all comes together in my mind, I believe that's what this was about. I believe that she was involved in this. We know, we know that she knew about all these discussions. And we also know that she kind of kept herself separated from the Ethereum free pass discussions. But I showed a video last week on stage of Katie Hahn, and she was she knew about it. She knew about what, what was going on, and so did Ryan Selkis, because he said it on stage too. And sat down with him, and what the chairman of the SEC said was, look, form a small group, working group and come up with some suggestions. Uh, pretty much saying, look, we're tired of talking to people about the how we test. Uh, put some real practical suggestions together. So Andreessen Horowitz, together with uh, Union Square Ventures, sat down with three law firms, McDermott, Will and Emery, Perkins Coie, and Cooley, all of whom had a fairly significant crypto practice. 
uh, together with two academics, Joe Grunfest and Adam, uh, as well as NVCA. And we sat down and came up with a safe harbor that we felt we could, in fact, suggest to the SEC that they start their thinking in that direction. And we submitted that. Perkins Coie did a memo. It, you know, and it, if any of you don't have those materials, just let me know. I can email them to you. They were supposed to be confidential when submitted to the SEC. Within days, they were public. Uh, in fact, as the newspaper reporters were calling me, I'm going, oh my God, <laughs> you know, how did that get out? Uh, and all of us were immediately reaching out to Andreessen Horowitz saying, we didn't send it to honest. Uh, so why is the SEC of the United States having secret meetings with investors in Ethereum to make all this happen anyway? The really valuable uh, work product at this point, because and the reason I mention that is uh, Director Hinman's speech that I'm sure everybody at least is familiar with or has heard about. Most of what he says in there came out of the safe harbor as well as the meetings that we had with him. And I think that's where Brad... All right. The guy she's, a, she's talking about on stage here is one of the partners at Union Square Ventures. His name is Brad Burnham. Okay, she's going to describe here how Brad Burnham is the guy that literally gave the presentation to the SEC, which is what ended up being the Ethereum free pass, Hinman speech, and all that. They're giving the presentation, and Bill Hinman is sitting there. Okay, but here's what's interesting. What Brad Burnham's about to say is how they were doing this presentation of how we could decentralize this next phase of the internet and all this. Okay? The irony is, and, and the problem here is, is that what Brad Burnham is not saying is who are the, the disguised whales that own most of, the, probably not, we don't know, we need to know, who are the disguised whales from the Ethereum ICO that very likely own a very large amount of the Ethereum for this supposedly future decentralized thing that you're selling the S you're selling trying to sell to the SEC. That's the part that I bet you was not in the presentation. And it, it made an incredibly effective presentation in one of the days that we met with a variety of people at the commission as well as the CFTC. And so we got to hear the presentation at least six times that day. But it was so effective and you could see light bulbs going on in their, you know, in their heads as to, oh gee, we didn't really quite grasp that concept. Brad, just do you mind giving us a summary Alex, of what you told them? So, the, you know, basically we were arguing for the re-decentralization of the web and we were... Right. The re-decentralization of the web, but we're not going to tell you, Bill, about who owns this stuff. Or or did they? Or did he already know? I don't know. We need to know who the, these disguised... This is why we keep hitting this disguised whales from the Ethereum ICO. Because if you don't know... If you aren't told and there's not an audit of who the disguised whales were, you don't know if... All these guys, you don't know if Andrews and Horowitz, you don't know if Union Square Ventures, Joseph Lubin and Consensus and JP Morgan, you don't know if they're, you don't know if they're 50% of the ownership and they're all calling it decentralized. You don't know. You can't know. This is the reason we're all jumping up and down out here. Now, what I'm going to do is we're at the four minute mark on that video and I, this thing I'm doing is going 18 minutes so what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue this we're going I'm going to play the second half because it's good for you there's a lot of things you if you're just watching the video and I can't stop it you may not pick up things that since my crazy head has been in this for so long I there things just jump into my mind that, that you need to know so we'll continue this in the second video but I am the digital asset investor I'm not an investment advisor this is for entertainment purposes only please subscribe hit the like button and tell your friends and family that without knowing who the disguised whales were in the Ethereum ICO this whole thing is one big sham and they all know it that's why they can't say anything about the timeline john deaton's timeline that is not in dispute that's why they can't come on a show and talk about it that's why they can't refute it that's why they can't say a word about their own words is because without knowing that 
This thing is a total sham. All this decentralization talk, it's all one big load crock is what it is.